If you look at a representation of the interior of the Earth, it's often very clean cut. Perhaps a relic of how we thought if the interior of the planet was organized back in the day that's still persisting. But you might be tempted to think, even with modern representations, that it's as cleanly divided as layers, the crust, mantle, outer core, and inner core. And that's generally correct, but an oversimplification, because there are variations going on. Chief perhaps among these are two very odd structures deep below the surface of the Earth that present a mystery that is still unsolved to this day because they really are very weird. The fact is, we aren't certain what caused them. Known as Large Low Shear Velocity Provinces, or LLSVPs, or simply superplumes, they are structures located in the lower regions of the mantle that surround the liquid outer core of the planet. There are two of them. One is known as the African LLSVP and the other the Pacific LLSVP, and they extend laterally thousands of kilometers and are up to a thousand kilometers in height, reaching upwards towards the surface. Undoubtedly at high resolution these plumes are likely to be far more complex than what we can detect with current equipment. But ever since their discovery they have defied a clear explanation of why they are even there. And they are large, which is one of the confounding factors involved with them. They represent about 8% of the mantle, or about 6% of the entire mass of the Earth. These plumes are partly responsible for the Earth, during a large enough earthquake, ringing like a bell and swelling and contracting in response. They were discovered that way originally through seismic measurements several decades ago, and they get their name due to seismic waves passing more slowly through them, hence low shear velocity provinces. In a paper by Arwen Deuce and colleagues at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, link in the description below, they analyzed how the LLSVPs were dampening the energy of seismic waves and changing their velocity as they propagated. This can reveal information about the temperature of the plumes and what their composition is, along with their general shape and more precise measurement of their extent. They actually found the opposite of what they were expecting. The structures, which are thought to be hotter than the surrounding mantle, weren't dampening the seismic waves much at all, even at presumed higher temperatures, which should not be the case. One way this could happen is if the LLSVPs are actually made up of minerals with a large, crystalline yet viscous structure that can handle the higher heat in a stable way. Even as the mantle itself shifts and moves around in its very slow plastic state, this has a weird implication. It would imply that these plumes are very, very old and have been active since at least half a billion years ago, but potentially stretching back to the formation of the planet over four billion years ago. This means that the material that comprises the plumes may be very early primordial material from Earth's early days. And some of that might make it to the surface through volcanism to be studied in depth, but that's still kind of a stretch. As to what caused the plumes initially, it's still mysterious. But there's one possibility that might actually make the plumes a remnant of a catastrophe that happened to early Earth long ago that may have defined Earth as a planet that could support a biogenesis and life. This is Goosebumps material in a way because of the implications, more on that in a bit. So one hypothesis on how these plumes came to be and are still managing to persist is a bit complicated. It depends on whether the provinces are thermal only, meaning they have the same composition as the surrounding material, they are just hotter, or if they are chemically different from the surrounding material or some mix of the two. If it's entirely thermal, then it would imply that they are heat plumes of hot mantle material upwelling. This would mean that the Earth's interior is convective in a way we didn't realize. However, modeling showed that the shape and behavior of the plumes did not quite match what was expected for that. Another hypothesis is that the plumes are actually former plates, possibly continents, that have subducted and accumulated deep below and the Pacific Superplume does correlate, in a sense, with what is known as a slab graveyard, where subducted old plates sink through the mantle down to the bottom of the layer, near the core, and melt and become involved in superplume convection processes. As an aside, and if that's correct, it implies that Earth's core would need a lot of additional heat caused by radioactive decay in its core than it could produce on its own without the decay. In other words, the Earth's core is highly radioactive, perhaps more than we thought. That's not unexpected. Radioactive elements tend to be heavy, 
take uranium, which is 1.68 times heavier than a piece of lead of the same shape and size. So when Earth was newly formed and molten, it stands to reason that the heavier elements would tend to sink towards the core. But if the environment is really radioactive, then that has implications for other planets, potentially. Such as Mars's core may be warmer than we realized if it has a higher proportion of radioactive decay. What that would mean is unclear, but Mars is a weird one on the core count. It seems to have had a magnetic field at one point early in its history, and then it shut down for some reason. Had that not happened, Mars would be a very different planet than it is today, given that it's been bombarded unprotected by cosmic radiation and charged particles from the sun for some time. But there may be a clue, discovered in not too dissimilar of a way to Earth's superplumes. NASA's InSight lander that measured seismic activity on Mars detected what might be a layer of molten silicate rock overlaying its metallic core. That layer may be the culprit because it could act as an insulating layer that prevents Mars' core from producing a magnetic field, in addition to helping keep Mars' core hot, and may act to concentrate the radioactive elements. In other words, the layer is preventing the Martian still molten core from convecting. This would mean that if that molten rock layer didn't exist, Mars could still sustain a magnetic field. Or maybe not. Because there is a wrench in the works, and it's Venus. Venus doesn't have a native magnetic field either, though it does have an induced one, not being created in its interior, but from the solar wind interacting with its ionosphere. Yet Venus is about the same size as Earth, and you'd think internally it would be very similar. But for some reason, it's not. It could be that Venus's core is cooler than Earth's and can't convect, meaning less decaying radioactive elements deep down, which might be due to wherever Venus formed and the solar nebula being poor in such elements. But there is an elephant in the room and it brings us back to Earth's superplumes. So a third hypothesis to explain the superplumes is much more violent. This event seems to have actually had quite an effect on the solar system, more so than was originally thought. So it's the impact between Proto-Earth and a Mars-sized object called Thea. I've made videos on that before, and it's a major contender for how the moon formed. Thea hit with a glancing blow, blew the material that would coalesce to become the moon into space, and that explains why chemically the moon is extremely similar to Earth, to the degree that it's just too much for bodies that formed completely separately, even right next to each other in the solar nebula. But it may have done a lot more than form the moon. The blow was thought to be glancing in order to toss the lunar material out in the way that it did. That might mean that large amounts of the mantle of Thea might have been torn off and incorporated into Earth, and that material may still be there in the form of the superplumes. It may be that the superplumes sunk into the mantle because of high enrichment in iron oxide. It was heavier mantle material, which smaller planets can do that, as they do not differentiate as much when they were molten early on. Look at Mars. It's red because it has a lot of surface iron oxide, compared to Earth. This composition would also raise the density of the plumes, and might explain their behavior better. And it all starts fitting together like a puzzle. But there's more. Back to Venus. It may also be that the catastrophic impact of Thea affected the Earth's core to the point of mixing and disturbing it so much, it created a much more durable, long-lasting environment for sustaining a convective magnetic field. Since Venus did not undergo this kind of an impact, and indeed has no moon at all as a result, it may be that the impact was necessary to start up Earth's magnetic field in a sustainable way. And without the impact, planets just do not sustain them, even if they are nearly identical in size to Earth. But there is another tidbit. Mercury is an odd object in the solar system because its core is proportionally very large to the other planets almost as though it actually is a core of a formerly much larger planet that had its mantle ripped off somehow. In other words, Mercury might once have been a Mars-sized object, given that the blow between Thea and Earth was glancing, and Thea was a Mars-sized object to do what it did, it's possible that Thea's core survived. Mercury fits that shoe, so the superplumes may actually be the former mantle of the planet Mercury, and Mercury is Thea. But beyond that, just when you thought I'd made a video that didn't mention the Fermi Paradox, here it comes. If magnetic fields are on Mars to Earth-sized terrestrial planets are rare and situational and require a glancing blow impact, then that may be a showstopper for surface life on a world. 
Oceans are protective. But if abiogenesis doesn't happen in oceans at thermal vents, and indeed happens in volcanic pools on land, which is one of the two major hypotheses going right now, then no magnetic field, no life. Anything that would happen would get sterilized rapidly, explaining the great silence, or at least be very severely constrained. But not entirely because there are situations that can be envisioned where life might occur on an exomoon orbiting a planet with a protective magnetic field. Gas giants and ice giants produce magnetic fields as well, and exomoons are every bit as much of a possibility for life, and even civilizations, as proper exoplanets are. And it's also very possible that moons outnumber planets in general, as they do in the solar system. So it's not a strong solution to the paradox, but it does suggest that maybe life is everywhere, locked in ice shell moons. But where Earth becomes rare is that it has a magnetic field that can protect surface life whereas planets otherwise identical to it do not, all because of Earth's unlucky or lucky day when it was hit by a wandering planet. Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently backing up even further. Planetary collisions in the galaxy are not rare, we actually caught one in the act some years ago with an infrared telescope and a debris disk around a young star, so it may also be that these kinds of collisions are more common than we realize and then the outliers for this kind of thing in inner solar systems are actually Mars and Venus and not Earth. It remains to be seen, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.